takes me to get thrown out of here. So I'm Corey Quinn, and my day job is fixing the horrifying AWS bill because when it comes to cost and architecture in cloud, they're one and the same, whether you want to admit it or not. Uh, security is also tied into this because you take all those things and you don't really care about any of them until right after you really needed to care about them. I also write a newsletter every week that gathers the news from Amazon's cloud ecosystem and then gently and lovingly makes fun of it because of my deep-seated personality failures and I'm a terrible person. This talk is called Security Hub Hurts My Self-Esteem, and that's a problem for me, because I like myself. I have a dedicated AWS account for shitposting. In fact, its globally unique account alias is shitposting, because for some reason, no bank wanted that one. Uh, so when I set it up, I enabled every AWS security service that I could find to, to prove a point. Specifically, that data breaches will cost less than turning on all of the AWS security services to prevent the data breach. And we're talking Guard Duty, Security Hub, Inspector, Macy, CloudTrail, Config, CloudWatch, Trusted Advisor, WAF, Detective, and Secrets Manager. So, at the end of the first month, I checked the bill to see that if my hypothesis that it would be expensive was correct. It turns out that my hypothesis was extremely correct. It was extortionately expensive. And there's a reason that my shitposting account is also where I put the credit codes for filling out surveys at events like this for AWS that they then appear to take absolutely no action on whatsoever. But at least they're gathering data and I don't have to pay to store it. But the problem here is that it wasn't just expensive to turn on these security services. It was also insulting. Does anyone know what this is? That's right, it's a bunch of pictures of my dad yelling at me for holding the flashlight wrong. And my therapist likes to bust him out whenever I need to be taken down a peg or three. Uh, and that's kind of what it feels like when I fired up Security Hub after I turned on all these services and done some baseline level configuration. So for those who are blissfully unaware of what Security Hub is, is it acts as sort of a, a gathering point for all these other AWS services between accounts, between regions, availability zones, et cetera, et cetera, and puts them into a single place. And you can map a bunch of different compliance regimes to this. I wound up, at first I thought that there was something wrong with me because I got only a 31% on this. And I want to be clear, there is obviously something deeply and profoundly wrong with me, but not necessarily in this direction. Because in this case, the problem is instead with Security Hub that is basically just fire hosing nonsense at me. And that's what I want to largely talk about today. Uh, because I started off by enabling the CIS or CIS, however one wants to pronounce it, I don't care. I'm not fighting that battle today. Uh, Foundations Benchmark 1.4.0. We'll go back a bit. Ah, good Lord, what is, there we are. Things are acting up, great. So the Center for Internet Security is a nonprofit that puts out benchmarks that are generally accepted within the security community around a bunch of different things. They are best practices around configuring your environment. And, and as it turns out, they have a CIS AWS Foundations benchmark. And that feeds into Security Hub, which is what the rest of this talk rants about because of me. Now, they have a one, version 1.5.0 that came out about six months ago. But because Security Hub is an AWS service, it is nowhere near current. It instead uses the version that came out much before that. But that's what we do. And through the magic of computers and cloud, it turns that, the benchmarks into charging you money to yell at you about things that don't matter. It's a beautiful, empowering experience. Uh, I want to be clear, though, that there, the way that they set this up, there is a lot of gold. There's value in it. I'm not saying that there isn't or shouldn't be. What is going on with that today? But even the way that they structured it into those sections doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. I have been informed, for example, that both logging and monitoring are both passe or different aspects of different things. And now it's all observability, which is the same thing, except it costs me more. It's hipster monitoring for the new generation. So it also winds up going into a bunch of other stuff here. So I want to tear apart each of these sections and things it found for me that I take issue with, but also that I paid Security Hub to yell at me about, because why not? And AWS gets to hear about it as a result. They want customer feedback and don't read the surveys. They get it in talk form. 
So in the IAM section, identity and access management, there's a lot of reasonable stuff that you should all be doing. And in fact, if you're not doing some of this, stop listening to this talk immediately and go fix that instead. Uh, maintain current contact details in your account. Yeah, and you'd be surprised the number of companies that are unicorn startups spending $100 million a year on AWS and all the emails go to the Gmail account belonging to the founder because that's where the Amazon account that they buy underpants on winds up going and it's all connected together. Make sure your contact details are important. Uh, don't use the root account for things. Turn on multi-factor authentication to log in because yes, it can cost the same as the GDP of some smaller countries if you're not careful. Uh, but there's also some outdated stuff in here. It talks about IAM users, but never comes up with the important takeaway of don't use them. Use what used to be called AWS SSO, and then AWS renamed it to make it uh, more wordier and more confusing. It's now IAM Access Identity Center, or some combination of those words, and it's the right path. Bad name, good approach. But here's the stuff that this thing misses as I wound up stumbling through it. Uh, make sure your access keys are rotated every 90 days or less. Cool. I'm sorry. Why? We've done experiments. When we check keys into GitHub, ideally intentionally, and start a stopwatch, how long does it take for things to start hammering against your account? 20 seconds, give or take. The problem with that is that it's not minutes. It's seconds, and then it begins attempting to beat your account to death, mostly to spin up things that mine Bitcoin in the environment. So a 90-day rotation here doesn't really solve that problem in any meaningful way. The single bit of value that it has is that if you're rotating credentials, you have to keep track of where they live. Like think of wildcard SSL certificates that have a 10-year validity window. By the time that expires, it's gone all over the company, and you're going to be spending the next year of your life hunting down expiry notices. Having a shorter validity window is a good idea. But it seems like a minor thing to whine about as part of a benchmark. Also, my thanks to my AWS account team for that picture. Also, it wants to ensure the credentials that are unused for 45 days are automatically disabled. That's a great plan, Professor, because this is a recipe for freaking disaster. Uh, there's the idea of a break glass procedure that when things get locked out, there's this uh, 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 the set of credentials kept under lock and key that you can use out of band to get into things. If you're not using it every 45 days, it gets turned off. And you can also imagine what happens if there's a single thing that needs to run a quarterly report, which is, you know, about twice the duration of a 45-day expiry window. It's not a bad approach of turning off things that aren't being used, but just blindly doing it and setting the automation to do it for you means tears before bedtime. Ensure IAM users are managed centrally via Identity Federation or AWS organizations for multi-account environments. And holy God, I mean, yes, you should be federating users into your account, but once you do that, they're not called IAM users anymore. They are federated identities that assume permission sets that then in turn convey into roles that get assumed. Words matter. I know AWS forgets this, particularly when naming services with the term serverless in them, but I promise it's true. The problem now is when I start reading things like this, I begin to wonder if folks are just blatantly making things up and mostly talking with their hands when they're describing what's going on in an effort to convey understanding because this doesn't align with what things actually mean. Maybe storage as a general category will fare a little bit better. And this one drives me nuts in every compliance regime I've ever seen. They always want to make sure that your data and drives are encrypted at rest. This is important for your laptop. If someone makes off with it in a coffee shop, you basically want to be out the cost of the laptop, not all of the data that was on the laptop. But frankly, if you can get a hard drive out of an AWS data center facility and survive, Congratulations, you've earned it, good work. You're welcome to have whatever you want. Yeah, it, it's easier to do this and check the box so the auditor stops asking you pointed questions that annoy you. And these days, in many cases, it comes on by default, but it's not even in the top 10 list of things I would worry about. People think, oh, it's encrypted at rest. Awesome, that's not where cloud data breaches come from. It simply isn't. It's misconfiguration. It is granting too large of an access role and misadventure, we'll call it. You want stuff encrypted locally, but in a cloud, at rest, it doesn't solve what people believe it does, and it gives them a false sense of security. It recommends you enable MFA delete on your S3 buckets, and this is a bad recommendation in not just one, but two specific ways. 
The first is it makes it incredibly annoying to delete anything, which, you know, if I'm a cloud provider that charges per gigabyte, I kind of want to add some friction to deleting things because it's called an unbounded growth problem and we're just going to keep all the data forevermore. That's just me being petty and annoying. I mean, to, to misquote Bezos, your shitty data hygiene is my opportunity, presumably. So I'm sort of wondering if an AWS salesperson wrote that particular bit of guidance. Uh, but secondly, to enable multi-factor delete within AWS S3, you need to do it from the root account. You know, the thing you're explicitly not supposed to use for anything under penalty of death and there should be screaming alarms that go off if you log into it. Yeah, it's, it's a little on the wild side. If you actually care about making sure that things don't get deleted outside of cycle, there's a, new, uh, there's a feature that came out about a year and a half ago called object lock with compliance and legal hold modes. Use that instead, but be careful what you turn it on for. It can get very expensive and you probably don't want to carry just random transactional scratch space for the next seven years because some auditor got overzealous. Okay. There's a block public access setting available in S3 account wide. And when you enable that, suddenly you're no longer allowed to have public S3 buckets. The problem, of course, on some level is that blindly enabling that for things that have been around for a while will cause breakage. Because S3 has two services, two functions that work really well, but not together. One of them is it acts as a web server at global scale for static files. Great. The other is it's infinite storage to store your most sensitive backups of all the things you really care about. Cross those streams, everyone dies. It doesn't go well. So one or the other, not both in the same bucket. Pro tip for citations on this, read basically any data breach touching on cloud for the last eight years. Now that's great. The problem, and there are ways to avoid doing it, but we've proven as an industry that we're not able to do things consistently, so there's now an account-wide setting that it recommends that we turn on or it yells at you. But wait, there's a second control. They want the exact same thing on a bucket-by-bucket -bucket basis as well. It's such a nice control, they want us to turn it on twice. They found it's ridiculous. Why not do it, then do it a third time or a fourth time as well? There are multiple other ways you can block people from accessing things. In many cases, crappy documentation makes it much harder for people to access things. Try that approach. Just smash that square peg of blocking access into increasingly inappropriate holes. And because we keep seeing data breaches, because this stuff is confusing, they just add more and more screaming red flags in the console that yell at you, even though there are, again, very valid reasons to do it in particular constrained circumstances. Now let's talk about logging. This is great. If you are fortunate enough to work in an environment where one of your colleagues is an actual literal princess, congratulations. You can kidnap her for ransom and then use it to pay for Splunk. The rest of us have to deal with the first party offerings that AWS brings to the table, uh, which are not Splunk. Now, ensure cloud trails enabled in all regions. Once, exactly once, the first management trail is free, like any good drug pusher. First taste is free, exactly. The second one's charge per event. And when I go out into various environments and I see paid events in CloudTrail, it is 99% of the time a misconfiguration. I, oh, you click that button, you'll stop spending 60 grand a month on that. People are really happy about that for about 10 seconds and then they realize, wait, how long has that been enabled? Like, that was just a tax on not knowing that bit of trivia about this stuff. The exception case, that 1%, is when your security team wants an unadulterated copy of the cloud trail that is pristine and has not been filtered through anything else. Okay, but you have a very clear line item of how much that's costing a month to do it, the business gets to decide. I like the idea of turning it on, don't do it twice. Ensure cloud trail trails are integrated with CloudWatch logs. Wrong, jackhole. That was a good piece of advice two or three years ago. But now the future and the way in the light is something called CloudTrail Lake. It winds up consuming those things, stores it in a searchable database. It charges more. It is $2.50 per gigabyte ingested, which sounds super steep. But that also includes storage for up to seven years which means you don't have to make a continuous investment decision of do we keep those audit trail logs or do we get rid of them to save money because the cost has been front loaded. Of course, none of the controls are aware that this exists. Why would they be? You want this. It's amazing. You don't necessarily want it going to CloudTrail, CloudWatch logs. 
Uh, ensure AWS config is enabled in all regions. This service is functionally a tax on using the cloud like they want you to use the cloud. This is charged for rule evaluation and configuration change in your environment. If you treat the entire cloud like it's an extension of your crappy data center with slightly fewer raccoons in it, great. This will not cost you much of anything at all. But if you're spinning things up and spinning them down a lot, this winds up becoming an increasingly large burden. And as a result, you can use this as sort of a proxy for how cloudy your environment is. The problem is, is that you're finding out that you're doing the right thing by paying more money, which seems a little counterproductive. It can also become a top five most expensive service. I built a uh, web app Twitter client that is deployed to 20 different regions. My infrastructure spend for that is about 70 cents a month, except the month I deployed it, where the config charge was 17 bucks. It adds up. Ensure VPC flow logging is enabled in all VPCs. Holy crap. Do you have any idea how fiendishly expensive that's going to be to turn on for all your VPCs all the time? And the answer to that, quite sincerely, is no, you don't. Because it is impossible to predict until you, until you do it. How big is the log going to be from a terabyte of internet traffic? Nobody knows. You're going to have to wait and see. So let's see what AWS has to say about their pricing example on their page. Now, they wind up effectively giving a hypothetical example of 72 terabytes being passed out. You don't need to read this. It's fine. The general shape of it's good enough. And you archive it for a month. And of course, it looks like a basic differential freaking equation because of their tiering approach, because customer obsession to that particular team is just words on a page somewhere. But the example they give here is, OK, that'll cost you $13,000 to ingest it and another $1,000 a month to store it with the baked in assumption that if that 72 terabytes then compresses down to 30, and oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. It is ridiculous. What are they doing over there? I don't know, but turning these things on across the board for things that don't need it, not a great plan. So now we turn our attention to the monitoring side of the world, which is, again, hipster monitoring is now observability, but monitoring is what they call it. Uh, vendors hate this because it's harder to convince you to spend basically your last fundraising round on monitoring. Observability, no one knows what the hell that is, so it's probably expensive. And what I have to say is they actually kind of li I like the things that they put in here. I didn't have any actual problems with the findings. Instead, I had problems with the implementation. Uh, they want a bunch of very specific CloudWatch metrics, alarms, and dashboards set up with exact values. And if you don't have those exact values, then it's not going to pass these things. What they're going to do is then alert you on a bunch of security stuff, like failed logins to the console. That's useful to know. If someone changes login, uh, if someone winds up changing uh, CloudTrail configuration, stuff like that. The problem, of course, is that I ignore the way that they recommend it, and you should too. There's an open source project that Victor Grenu came out with called the AWS Survival Kit, which is awesome. It's a CloudFront distribution. It's a, it's, a, uh, ah, it's a cloud formation template that's generated by a couple of commands, applies to your account, sets up the stuff you care about, and then alerts you through a variety of ways, email, Slack notification, et cetera, when certain things happen. And it's awesome. It doesn't bend the knee, though, to AWS's very specific requirements, so the check turns green, so it's still going to scream at you. So I think that the requirements are reasonable, the implementation abysmal. Go ahead and grab that. Thank me later. So let's talk about networking. TCP now terminates on the floor, and your day is about to become immeasurably worse because no one's happy diving into networking unless that's their actual job all the time. <sighs> Specifically, it winds up yelling at me that security groups should not allow ingress from the internet to port 22 or port 3389, depending on whether it's Linux or Windows. Those are the administration ports. Well, gee, professor, how did it get that way in the first place? Well, when you use the EC2 launch wizard, it builds something that does exactly that. This, is, this entire criticism here is blaming you for the failures of other AWS service teams, and I assume that the intended goal is to get you to go and complain to those other service teams, because as best I can tell, AWS teams aren't allowed to talk to one another due to a strict interpretation of their NDA, so they have to bank shot the feedback off of customers. Here we are. They have another very similar rule as well about network ACLs should not allow ingress from the internet 
to those particular ports because you don't have enough work to do. So they want the same control for network ACLs too. You should not be using network ACLs at all. They are granular, they are constrained in the number of them you can use, and no one remembers they're there, so when something doesn't work, you think you've lost the plot somewhere. But this thing whines at you for not going ahead and setting this up to trip over later in time. Now, it also whines, uh, the default network ACLs are very sensible. Everything in AWS can talk externally to something else. And then security groups are how you get more granular. That's a rational answer that a human being might approach it, but no, it upsets the security dingus so it gives you outdated advice you shouldn't follow. Speaking of that, great. The default security group within a VPC should not allow inbound and outbound traffic. So every time you create a VPC, and there's always a default VPC in every region, incidentally, there's a default security group that allows outbound traffic. No, you can't stop it from creating those default security groups. No, you cannot delete the default security group. So you have to go into each and every VPC manually or programmatically, but most people do it manually, to remove the rule for the default security group that lets things talk to the internet. And remember, their guidance is, is that that's sort of like a fallback security group you probably shouldn't be using in the first place. And you have to do this in every VPC, in every region, of every account that you're using, including the ones that you're not using for anything or the security checks, you guessed it, once again fail. This is why people who work in security for a living tend to have problems with substance abuse. Now I want to be clear, they did get a few things right. They don't have a control that mandates password rotation anymore, which is good. Uh, they, that leads to people using crappy passwords. And the stuff I didn't talk about in depth is good. Use MFA, don't have databases sitting on the internet that are just listening to everything. Uh, don't hit yourself in the face with a hammer, awesome. It's a good starting point in here. We all start somewhere, but it's also a far cry from a generic set of advice that's going to apply universally to everyone. And it is expensive, but there is a bigger problem with a lot of these default choices. Does anyone remember Nessus or heard of it or used it? For those who don't, it's a jobs program for mediocre consultancies. They would wind up running a Nessus scan, slapping their logo at the top, and it would sprint out a really thick report of all the security findings. And most of them were nonsense, like weird encryption standards that aren't the latest and greatest. And then buried somewhere in the middle there, you have things that are actually important but people miss. And that problem too, the problem here is that it winds, worse than the cost, is that it's hiding things you really want to jump on but don't get enough attention for because they're too busy nattering at you about bullshit. It bothers me, and if I have to deal with this, so do you. So that brings us to the big conclusion and the question here of should you enable Security Hub? And the answer is a resounding hell yes, but probably not for the reason you think. Uh, it doesn't matter what it does or what it costs. If it's just ballast on your AWS bill, good for you. But when you inevitably suffer a data breach, do you want the tech press stories to be about how there was a thing called Security Hub that you didn't enable? You sound criminally negligent already. You're going to wind up getting yeeted out of the company into the snow as a result because your boss, execs, board, and shareholders are all going to ask why it's not configured. It is a brilliant AWS service name that drives adoption. Same thing applies to guard duty as well. Turn them on. It's a tax on going about your business and not getting yelled at, which is what it's all about. I'm Corey Quinn. This has been a perhaps overly cynical take on what Security Hub is, but in my own defense, it is very hard to be polite to someone who just tried to rob you. To keep up with my adventures, you can follow the newsletter at lastweekinaws.com. I am at time at this point. I'll be here the rest of the day. Now, go watch a talk from someone who actually has something constructive to say. Thank you. And we are, yeah, next talk's in five minutes. Go, go, what are you all here for? <laughs>